think it's eight o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's uh, Brad Jacobson. I'm one of the PGY4 residents here at Moran. Um, just as a reminder, if there are any like questions or comments, go ahead and type them in the comment section, and then we can address those after each presentation. That way, the presenter can go through their entire presentation without being interrupted. Um, so we're going to start off with Catherine Hu. Catherine's one of the PGY3 residents here at Moran Eye Center. She's from the Bay Area in California and attended med medical school in St. Louis. Um, when asked where her ideal vacation is, she answered Southeast Asia for straight food and Antarctica for orca and penguin watching. Couldn't decide on one place. Anyways, Catherine's going to be talking to us about a not so textbook case of GCA. So go ahead and take it away, Catherine. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Brad. Uh, so this is a patient that uh, I saw on my last month of consults as a PGY2. And so I'm just going to go right into the case. So this is an 80 year old woman coming in with one week of painless monocular vision loss in the left eye. And um, she described her symptoms as about one week ago in uh, on one week ago, about on Monday, she started having kind of just generalized blurry vision in that left eye, uh, but then also started seeing some floaters and then eventually saw this kind of dark blob coming over the top of her vision. So what was really interesting and very striking about this patient was her review of systems. So she said about four months ago, she started having myalgias and arthralgias, uh, mostly in her hips and her neck. About three months ago, she started having some shooting left-sided neck pains shooting up to the right side of her face. And notably, she actually went to a sports medicine doctor around this time and was started on a short course of prednisone. And she said that this actually improved her symptoms quite significantly. And after she tapered off her steroids, they actually eventually did return, especially that right-sided, sorry, the left-sided neck pain shooting up her face. About two months ago, she described a new onset left-sided throbbing, kind of dull, achy, five out of 10 left-sided headache. And she also uh, self-volunteered information like scalp tenderness. And she said um, that it actually hurt her skin to touch or actually comb her hair. And all throughout this time, she was developing more generalized fatigue and weakness. So these are just some quotes that I found really memorable from her and that she again kind of self volunteered and she really kind of almost classically described this textbook. Um, proximal muscle weakness and jaw claudication. So I just remember her motioning and holding both of her sides of her jaw. She said, yeah, it really hurts on both sides when I chew more than four mouthfuls, um, which I thought was um, very memorable in her kind of uh, clinical course. And then um, just some history, she was otherwise a pretty healthy woman, had a very active lifestyle. Uh, she had a history of hypertension that was previously controlled, well controlled on medications, but now was uh, doing just fine on diet and lifestyle modifications. Uh, she denied any other vascular risk factors, including uh, diabetes. She had cataract surgery in terms of her past ocular history. But otherwise, like I mentioned, was pretty healthy and uh, a very active woman. On uh, MRI, showed uh, chronic microvascular disease, um, but was otherwise unremarkable. There was no evidence of stroke. There was also no abnormal um, appearance of the optic nerve or orbits. And her laboratory results on admission were notable for elevated inflammatory markers, as you can see here with platelets, ESR, and CRP. Um, and so on an exam, she had a slightly de decreased visual acuity in the left eye associated with the left APD. Um, she also endorsed some superior, uh, superior peripheral deficits in the left eye on bedside confrontational visual fields. Otherwise, her pressure, color, motility were normal, and her anterior segment was normal. Uh, most notable on her dilated fundus exam was kind of the C-shaped uh, kind of edematous fluid cuff nasally, which you can actually see here. Um, and it was quite striking uh, how pale the edema was and kind of coming up on my um, uh, indirect exam. You can see this was very nicely captured by uh, Dr. Sean Collin as he was taking buddy call with me um, during this evening. And then she did actually come from an outside uh, eye care provider who provided this 30-2 um, 30, 30 Humphrey visual field and this showed a pretty dense superior arcuate defect in her left eye and I don't think that we had visual field testing. Um, she didn't come with visual field testing from her right eye. Uh, so in summary, we have an 80-year-old lady who's presenting with one week of uh, painless monocular vision loss and pale nerve edema in the left eye in the setting of three to four months of left-sided headache, jaw claudication, scalp tenderness, proximal muscle weakness, and elevated ESR-CRP. 
So normally I would ask the residents, you know, for a differential diagnosis, but in the interest of time and also getting to the salient learning points that I want to discuss today, um, I'll just go ahead and say that there should be one disease entity that's quickly rising to the top in terms of um, high suspicion. And that of course is GCA. So a few words about GCA. This is a systemic vasculitis um, that affects medium to large vessels in the body. It is almost exclusively a disease of the elderly and tends to uh, affect females more as well as those of Scandinavian descent. And depending on the source worldwide, the incidence is about 15 to 35 per 100,000 per 100, persons um, over the age of 50. Of course, the classic kind of constellation of symptoms, you have headache, jaw claudication, vision loss, scalp tenderness, and also polymyalgia called rheumatica, which is a kind of a systemic complex of, um, of proximal muscle weakness and also girdle muscle weakness um, associated with fatigue that can also be uh, classically associated with GCA. Uh, it can affect the super superficial temporal arteries, but it can really, it classically affects the superficial temporal arteries, um, but can really affect any uh, vessel, uh, any branch of the aorta. And vision loss can be a result of anterior arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, or AAION, uh, but really it can, uh, GCA can present in other forms of an ischemic vasculitis, uh, including symptoms of diplopia, eye pain, um, and can really manifest as uh, anything from cranial neuropathies to uh, a vascular, uh, a retinal vascular uh, occlusion. And so gold standard is a temporal artery biopsy, which we'll kind of get to in a little bit later in our discussion. And then steroids are mainstay of treatment, um, though tocilizumab, and, uh, which is a anti-human interleukin-6 receptor mono, uh, monoclonal antibody, and other steroids-bearing agents uh, are coming on the market, and tocilizumab was most, uh, most recently approved in 2017. So for our patient, she was admitted for three days of IV solumedrol one gram daily to the inpatient neurology service. And then she was discharged on high dose oral prednisone and her uh, temporal artery biopsy was planned for the next day. So she showed up to Moran pre-op and unfortunately she was found to be tachycardic. And uh, incidentally on an EKG, she was found to actually be an AFib with RVR. So we sent her to the ED and she was diagnosed with new onset paroxysmal AFib that was uh, attributed to her initiation of high dose steroids. So we had uh, deferred her, uh, her biopsy, of course, at that day and had kind of tentatively planned it for, for later that week. So on Wednesday, uh, I was paged by the inpatient cardiology team as an FYI as a consult resident, which if you didn't know is never a good thing. Um, and so they actually told me, unfortunately, our patient had presented to uh, the ED with chest pain and had had a heart attack. And her, EG, her EKG actually showed ST elevation. So this was a STEMI. She was emergently taken to the cardiac cath lab, which showed 100% uh, LED occlusion, and she underwent emergent uh, percutaneous coronary intervention. Um, so this is actually uh, part of her balloon angioplasty that I grabbed from her cardiac cath imaging. This is actually a schematic that is part of her, uh, this is a schematic actually of her um, vessels that was included in the cardiac cath report. So you can actually see she has a 100% distal LED occlusion, kind of more in the apical core region. And the video that I just showed is her balloon angioplasty and they were able to um, get the, uh, get pretty, restore pretty good blood flow just after balloon angioplasty um, and didn't need to, to give her more stenting. So fortunately our patient um, recovered well and she was in stable condition and good spirits and she remained in the inpatient inpatient unit. But this of course throwed a wrench into uh, our our uh, our diagnostic and also management plans. So um, we pretty much were a little bit stuck. She was now on a 48 IV heparin drip on blood thinners and of course in no kind of medical condition to continue a temporal artery biopsy uh, uh, safely. So what were we to do? This was kind of a pretty big challenge. Um, given her classic presentation, we thought about treating her kind of more or less empirically for GCA without a biopsy. However, getting her off steroids was more or less of a priority now that it, we were pretty sure it had uh, caused this cardiac event. And also, um, we discussed that without a diagnostic procedure, management would be difficult if her symptoms recurred or relapse in the future with inappropriate cessation of treatment or early cessation of treatment and we had not gotten to the bottom of the etiology during the sensitive time window. So kind of 
if only there were a safe, non-invasive way to help us reach our answer. And I think I hear kind of some of you pondering, but also thinking, maybe I hear you guys thinking that uh, maybe we could perform a bedside ultrasound with Dr. Harry while she was inpatient in the CVICU. So of course, that's what we did, and we were very fortunate to be able to complete that next day in the inpatient unit. So a few words on Doppler uh, ultrasound. So this is a uh, the classic kind of sign that we look for on a color Doppler ultrasound is the halo sign. And this is inflammatory exudates as well as edema uh, surrounding the vessel wall and into the tunica media. So this is called the halo sign. It is a hypoechoic rim of vessel wall edema and then also like I said in inflammatory exudates and you actually see kind of this dark rim. Um, around both uh, longitudinal and also cross-sectional views of a vessel. It's also non-compressive, so it does not go away with compression of the vessel. So the, uh, the benefits of Doppler ultrasound are very apparent, um, especially that it can provide immediate real-time information, um, just kind of at the bedside. It's non-invasive and cost-effective. When comparing that to what we think about with temporal artery biopsy, there can be a delay in procedure and logistics, coordinating OR time, coordinating, uh, coordinating uh, patient, patient care coordination, um, and also sometimes coordinating the cessation of blood thinners and things like that to, so that we can do the procedure safely. And also sometimes there can be a, di uh, a diagnostic delay in actually reading the pathology slides themselves. Um, when compared, of course, to the immediate real-time information that you can gain from a Doppler ultrasound. Complications of the biopsy include facial nerve injury, wound infection, and scalp necrosis. And depending on the source, of course, um, uh, false negative rates vary very widely from 1.8% in the literature to 34% in the literature. Um, and and most uh, people attribute this to skip lesions, lack of temporal artery involvement in the manifestation of the GCA itself, or uh, if there was any response to steroid therapy prior to the biopsy being taken. Of course, Doppler ultrasound does not come with it, oh, its own caveats. The first is that it's not standardized in terms of the equipment that uh, different groups are using and the uh, acquisition of images as well as the interpretation. And it's also operator dependent. Of course, not everybody has a wonderful Dr. Harry at their disposal at their institution who can kind of uh, not only be the expert in obtaining these images, but also helping us interpret them. And um, studies that have been conducted so far in the literature with analysis of detection rates of GCA have been pretty small in terms of sample sizes with less than 100 people. And then um, a, systemic, a systematic review that was recently published in JAMA kind of looked in the 10 major studies that have been published in the literature and also sensitivities and specificities uh, have also have a wide range so far in these small studies. And we're ranging from 55 to 10 uh, to 100, sorry, 55 to 100 percent uh, sensitivities and 78 to 100 percent specificities in the published literature. Um, so for our uh, patient, we performed a Doppler ultrasound uh, at the cardiac ICU. We also performed a B scan and it showed no emboli detected uh, posterior to the lamina cuprosa. And she did have a positive halo sign in her bilateral temporal artery. So it was interesting that even though she had, uh, of course, we classically, when we take a, um, a biopsy, we take the side that is the affected side, which was her left side that she was experiencing vision loss. But she actually had a positive halo sign in both sides, which is also an advantage of of the Doppler ultrasound being that it's non-invasive, you can take a very good look at the both, both cross-sectional and longitudinal view of both vessels. And so if you can kind of see with me here, she had this hypoechoic rim or that dark ring halo around the vessel. And if it's not obvious enough, I've highlighted it with, a, with an actual halo. And so these are a little bit some um, some more pictures uh, of that that hypoechoic rim. This is another cross sectional view here of her uh, left temporal artery, and then a, a longitudinal view. And then um, in the latter half of the page, you can see her right temporal artery also had um, a hypoechoic rim that uh, that fluid kind of that fluid rim of uh, halo of edema, uh, indicating inflammatory disease and very convincing for GCA. So in our patient, kind of taking her whole clinical picture, uh, her clinical presentation, her elevated inflammatory markers, the fact that subjectively in terms of her vision, she had improved uh, very much so with uh, the initiation of high dose steroids. And also now with this new information of ultrasound, we were comfortable foregoing a temporal artery biopsy and continuing to treat this as GCA. 
rheumatology was consulted and they were on board and they um, got the patient onto a safe kind of tapering regimen of prednisone and they've been managing her ever since. They also were able to have uh, her um, start in tocilizumab as a expedited um, initiation of that steroid, steroid sparing therapy. So of course, if you have been to Resident Research Day in recent years, you know that you're familiar with this topic as presented by Dr. Harry and also Dr. Michael Burrow, who was one of our um, chief residents last year. And I believe that, that uh, the resident role of that research project has been taken over by Dr. Abigail Jebaraj. So definitely ask Dr. Harry and Dr. Jebaraj about this project. Uh, they are currently recruiting patients um, for validation and detection of GCA. Um, so a lot of kind of interesting and exciting things to come in terms of validation to use this modality to diagnose GCA, uh, while T, uh, the TA biopsy still remains, of course, the gold standard for diagnosis. So I also had a question in terms of our patient's um, her, um, cardiac disease and her uh, heart attack, which of course was very, very striking in terms of uh, her clinical course. So I had talked to her cardiology team and they were fairly certain that the new onset paroxysmal AFib had, uh, of course, played a pretty large role in the thrombus that ended up in her coronary arteries. And that was attributed to the high dose of steroids that she was started on. But it was a little bit kind of peculiar because she had only been on steroids for four days at the point that she had uh, presented with AFib and she only really, um, at least symptomatically and also uh, documented, had one occurrence of this new par paroxysmal AFib and that was one day prior to her heart attack. So I had wondered if GCA or maybe vessel wall inflammation had played a played a role in her myocardial infarction. Talking to her cardiologist, it's definitely on the differential. She, in her cardiac catheterization, the angiogram, it did show some vessel wall, um, some mild vessel wall luminal irregular, uh, irregularities. Um, but this is fairly nonspecific, though it can be uh, present in a vasculitis. So looking in the literature, um, Aortitis and inflammation of the aorta and aortic dissection and aneurysms is a, is a pretty well-documented um, occurrence in GCA or complication of GCA. Um, however, coronary arteritis is much less, uh, is, is much less of a, um, is under-recognized in terms of a complication that can happen of GCA. So in the literature, I found about maybe four or five case reports, very few, uh, where there's actually biopsy proven um, coronary arteritis from granulomatous inflammation in a patient that had biopsy proven temporal arteritis with uh, vision changes and then subsequently had a myocardial infarction. And again, these were post mortem biopsy proven results uh, for coronary uh, arteritis. Um, and then also, um, also in the literature, uh, there have been several kind of large uh, population studies. This one came out of Canada, where they did show an increased risk of cardiovascular disease uh, in GCA when comparing, um, or when controlling rather, for hypertension and hyperlipidemia and medications. Um, and this was actually thought to be attributed to the fact that GCA and vasculitides can are pro -athero thrombo uh, are they promote atherosclerosis, and they also uh, have an increased rate of thromboembolism. And then finally, there was a large cohort study that came out uh, of the Annals of Internal Medicine recently, and this was a large population study, I think about 3,400 patients, and this came out of the UK Primary Care Database. And they also showed uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, including myocardial infarction, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, uh, and associated with GCA. And they noticed that the uh, increased uh, rate of these vascular events actually uh, most commonly occurred one month after diagnosis of GCA. And they attributed this also to um, complications from steroids in terms of that hydosteroids are also associated with being pro-atherosclerotic. And uh, the fact that since uh, a temporal artery biopsy is our gold standard, um, sometimes cessation of blood thinners or uh, things like that can maybe lead to vascular accidents. So a quick slide, of course, on steroids. We know that steroids are not benign. Um, and uh, Dr. Nasher in the Junior, J Journal of Rheumatology, they published a 15-year study, a uh, 15-year survey of um, 43 patients that they followed after um, uh, treatment of GCA. And 58% of these patients developed at least one major steroid complication uh, in, in an average follow-up of three years. And the majority of these um, complications uh, were bone fractures and infections. But of course, we do know that steroids can cause multitude of things, including exacerbation of existing diabetes 
uh, diabetes and hypertension, robotic events, atrial fibrillation like it was in our patient, GI bleeds, and other kind of um, comorbidities or worsening of comorbidities. So for our patient, thankfully she had preservation of vision. She's 20-20. Uh, uh, her first follow-up in clinic with us was one week after discharge, so about 10 days after her initial presentation and initiation of treatment. And so her symptoms had almost completely resolved without recurrence. She was on uh, oral prednisone and then also, uh, she's still on a prednisone taper rather, um, and continues on tocilizumab um, and is uh, tolerating these well relatively well without side effects. Her atrial fibrillation and ca cardiac health are, are stable. They're talking to her cardiologist. Her, type her, her hypertension right now is the, uh, is the biggest challenge while she's still on prednisone. So this is when she was seen in neuroophthalmology clinic about, again, 10 days after presentation, one week after discharge. You can see that uh, she just has a touch of edema inferiorly and nasally, but it does look improved when she first came to us uh, on the initial consult presentation. And then also uh, her superior arcuate defect has improved in the left eye as well. So some takeaway points. Uh, my, inten my intention in presenting this case wasn't so much as an m and and certainly not to be a, um, a comprehensive review of all the facets of GCA, but I just thought it was very striking in terms of when things kind of become more challenging and when we aren't able to perform diagnostic and management the way that uh, we typically do. So of course, also in this patient, she is kind of the most classic textbook a clinical picture of GCA that I have encountered as a resident. And it was very, of course, uh, striking when she self-volunteered all the information in terms of jaw claudication and proximal, proximal muscle weakness. So there's some teaching points, uh, especially as a resident, that I took away from this case, especially it being a very memorable case in my last month of consults last year. So that of course we know steroids are not benign and we should do also everything in our power to not only facilitate uh, diagnostic testing as, as soon as possible, but also work with multi disciplinary teams to manage uh, these medications. Doppler ultrasound, of course, can aid in diagnosis and not only provide more information, but this was a great patient example of how this can actually really be a helpful diagnostic tool when a temporal artery biopsy is not possible or not safe to perform given the medical considerations. Um, and then of course, working with rheumatology is very important in the management of these patients, not only getting them on the appropriate dose of steroids and a safe taper, but also now that we have steroids bearing uh, biologics that we can use at our disposal. And of course, just keeping in mind those very rare systemic complications, but things like uh, cardiovascular disease um, should be kind of in the back of our minds, uh, given this patient's uh, outcome, and then also working with cardiology or other uh, teams to manage these conditions, especially kind of looking out for them uh, during the one month immediately, uh, immediately after diagnosis. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Harry, Dr. Warner, and also Dr. Patel, and as well as Anna Contino, she's the attending of cardiology, and then also some of my internal medicine friends for helping me locate the LED on uh, coronary artery vascular anatomy for this presentation. Uh, so here are my references, and I'd gladly take any questions. Awesome, thanks, Catherine. I think, uh, Dr. Harry, you had a comment, right? Right, so I just kind of, jump in here for a second. That was excellent, Catherine. Very good uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, as you read the literature, especially rheumatology literature, there's a lot of variants. Some articles are very strong. Uh, Doppler ultrasound is going to take over and uh, uh, obviate the need for temporal artery biopsy. Others are iffy and say, well, it's not that great. You can do it, but you still need a biopsy. So kind of we're going back and forth. I think the study which started with Mike Burrow and Abby's going to help with uh, our, our goal is to get more numbers, just to get higher numbers and get a higher, uh, you know, uh, sense of, of, you know, the value of it. So far, we're pretty good. I think we've got about uh, 22 patients in the study officially and a couple of others that were unofficial and we're 100% so far, but I don't claim that's going to be forever. But unfortunately, with COVID, like everything else, the study's kind of on hold. We were, weren't allowed to proceed until we kind of resolved the, the COVID situation. So, uh, we can still do them. It, you know, it's not part of the study, but we can still, like in this case, it's available if you have a patient that's there's a problem with a biopsy or logistically or medically, uh, we can still do the, 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 uh, the, the Doppler ultrasound. I, I think personally, if I see a case where it's bilateral, the halo sign, that's pretty strong. If I see that, I think we're really probably as good as a biopsy or better. Um, also, the idea of the skip lesions in biopsies are always an issue. 
Um, it kind of goes back and forth again. If you get a, a long section, probably it's not so much, but uh, again, maybe Doppler could help in that sense to identify the part of the artery that doesn't have the halo sign and then guide the biopsy for that. So another role possibly for, for uh, Doppler at some point. So anyway, again, just a very good, very good discussion. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Dr. Harry. This is Jeff Petty. I have a quick question uh, too, actually. Are there points now where your pretest probability is such that you're going to treat no matter what, we can forego a biopsy, um, uh, you know, e even in the absence of ultrasound, and then second, uh, just, just indication contraindications uh, for tussleizumab? Yeah, I would say that um, actually, uh, I had a slide that I took out kind of for a time, but let me see if I can pull it up here. But the um, American College of uh, Rheumatology, actually their diagnostic criteria uh, that was actually devel developed in the 1990s, um, it actually has, if you guys can see my screen here, um, they recommend, they said that three out of five of these diagnostic criteria, so age over 50, new onset localized headache, uh, and then also a, um, or like scalp tenderness or a t uh, temporal artery tenderness, and then elevated ESR and, um, and then also a positive uh, artery biopsy. If you have three out of five of these diagnostic criteria, that can be up to, I think, the high 90s in, certain, in terms of specificity and sensitivity. Um, though some people, of course, have criticized this, and it hasn't really been updated since the 1990s. So I think from a rheumatology standpoint, if you have a very convincing clinical picture, even in the absence of the gold standard of diagnostics, um, you can go ahead and kind of treat as GCA. I think in our practice, we we very uh, as as mo most as as possible as as much possible as much as possible um, we pursue uh, diagnostic testing and then tocilizumab. I actually um, didn't get a chance to really review in terms of uh, treatment contraindications. If anybody else has any comments, of course, to add, or if Dr. Harry has uh, additions in terms of um, when to kind of forego a, or when we feel comfortable foregoing a biopsy. Well, thank you for that, Catherine. Uh, I would think in this case, given the presentation, no matter what I had seen on ultrasound or temporal artery biopsy, I, I can't imagine not going forward with treatment, which again, would just make a question whether or not <clears throat> certainly with the biopsy it would be needed. Yeah, I think our, our concern was how to justify keeping this patient on a really high aggressive dose of uh, prednisone. And we didn't have kind of something to more hang our hat on, uh, especially since she had these cardiac events. And then also working uh, with rheumatology to get her on tocilizumab uh, more quickly. And then just if we had maybe, uh, if we had tapered down her steroids too quickly and she had a recurrence of disease, um, just things like that to consider in terms of feeling comfortable enough to go ahead to do that regimen. But I agree with you, it was already very convincing. Another question too is uh, how long on steroids would you uh, negate the biopsy or the ultrasound? So that's always been an issue. They say that you're safe to start steroids and do a biopsy within a few days. That's the kind of this classic teaching, but you know, how long? Mm -hmm. um, I saw one patient on it for 14 days and she had a very positive uh, halo sign. So that's another question to kind of answer is how long was, would steroids do if they start affecting the biopsy results or the ultrasound results? Right, exactly. Um, Catherine, mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Olson and Dr. Uh, Petty um, asked the question of steroid sparing agents, biologics, other immunosuppressants. You had touched briefly on tocilizumab. Um, uh, can you uh, clear up uh, or sort of uh, readdress that question of when the rheumatology service is using tocilizumab? Yeah, I actually didn't do that. I didn't really delve into that in terms of time, in terms of my own reading. So right. I apologize. I don't have that uh, information that re uh, readily, readily available, um, but I can definitely look. And then also, so, I think okay. The, I mean, I think that basically the 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 answer for you, Jeff, and you, Dr. Olson, is that um, there has been a very large um, study of tocilizumab, which is a biologic, um, and uh, it has been proven to be a very significant um, steroid reducing agent. And the rheumatology service is basically starting everybody on it immediately, um, but it is not a steroid. Um, alternative, you would not use it in the acute setting instead of um, loading up with steroids when somebody's losing vision, but they definitely are using it 
to, uh, to try and uh, get people off steroids or to the lowest possible dose more quickly. Uh, and it does seem to be quite safe and effective. That's and good news. Uh, methotrexate is sometimes also used in terms of um, a steroid sparing agent. R right, no other steroid sparing agent has been shown to be steroid um, alternative, right? So it's not instead of steroids, it's to try and reduce the dose of steroid. Right. All right, so just for sake of time, I think Dr. Patel had a comment in there as well, so we could read that, but I think we should move on to Mike Murray, um, who is also a PGY3 here at the Moran Eye Center. Uh, so Mike was born in Salt Lake, but spent the first five of his life living in Quito, Ecuador. He went to med school at Baylor in Houston, and his dream vacation spot is hiking and scuba diving in New Zealand. Um, Mike will be talking to us about a diabetic with blurry vision. So go ahead, Mike, once you get that screen shared. All right. Can you hear my microphone okay? Yeah. You can see my slides. Yeah, perfect. So I'll be presenting today a case uh, seen at retina clinic. It's a diabetic with blurry vision. Uh, she came in asked, uh, with a complaint of blurry vision in both eyes. Um, and she described uh, she's a 45 year old female with past medical history of diabetes. She had NPDR in the right eye, PDR in the left eye, myelonephritis, ARDS, hypertension. And she had been referred three months before for floaters and a shadow in the left eye uh, from optometry at Moran and was found to have vascularization elsewhere in the left eye and got PRP uh, 844 spots with the other specification there. And then she represented back to clinic for follow-up visit three months later. And we'll talk a little bit about this patient had a little bit of difficulty with compliance and follow up and paying for things. So that's why it took so long. But she had continued blurry vision in the left eye and a new blurry spot in her right eye. Let's see. That's there we go. So she said she had no pain, discomfort, or flashes. Uh, she said she'd been using a lot of pseudoephedrine for congestion in the last couple of days prior to the visit. Um, and then just other past medical history things. Her last day C was 11.4. She described occasional headaches. Uh, she's often lost the follow-up, as I mentioned before, and she uh, was morbidly obese with a BMI in the 60s. History and surgeries were kind of non-contributory. Uh, Medication, she was on diabetic and hypertensive medications occasionally took time. Allergies or family history and the social history, uh, no smoking or drug use. So in clinic, her visual acuity was 20, 25, 20, 30 at the visit three months prior. Left eye had had a drop in vision from 2070 at that visit three months before to 2250. Pupils, extraocular movements uh, were normal. The IOP was slightly elevated in the right eye. Up exam, uh, anterior segment was, was relatively normal. She had had vitreous hemorrhage in the right eye. For a dilated exam, she had some blurring of the disc margin in the right eye. And the cup to disc was about 0 0.2 in both eyes. Uh, there was also a blurring of the disc margin uh, in the left. Macula showed uh, inferotemporal NVE in the right eye. Otherwise, in the periphery, she had new buds of NVE nasally and dot blood heme in the right eye, and then she had some laser scars and uh, dot blood hemorrhages in the left eye. And the past DFE from the three months before showed that this was kind of new changes. This is a funness photo of both eyes. As you can see, uh, there's blurring of the disc margins more in the left eye. This is the OCT of the macula in the right eye. Uh, it was relatively normal. In the left eye, however, uh, there was a uh, 
know, tractional detachment. So the differential diagnosis in this case, uh, we kind of go through, you know, vascular causes, uh, bilateral spontaneous CRVO, um, hypertensive optic neuropathy with retinopathy, um, infectious causes such as a neuroretinitis. H, diabetic papillitis, um, and a vitreal macular or vitreal Oh, uh, her blood pressure was checked. Your internet is really bad. Do you want to move over here? Yes. Brad just told me my internet was really bad, so I'm going to come over here. We got a mobile presentation. Yeah, that'd be great. Incidentally, as I'm walking, my internet is still not up at my house. Uh, so. Thank you for hurricane force winds in Utah. The joke that snowed yesterday, we had a hurricane force winds, so the locusts are coming next week. So beware. Um, okay. Basically, um, uh, her blood pressure was checked in clinic and it was elevated. Oh, Brad, could you grab two papers that are in that? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, her blood pressure was checked in clinic. It was highly elevated. She was sent to the ER for further management. In the ER, she had labs, a CBC, a troponin were normal. Her CMP showed glucose that was uh, elevated to 330. Uh, her UA had some glucose and yeast in it. And then her BNP was elevated. Uh, she had an MRI brain without contrast. It didn't show any concerning intracranial findings. And then her chest x-ray did show mild pulmonary edema. Uh, her echocardiogram and EKG were normal, though. So she was admitted for two days, uh, diagnosed with hypertension. It was thought to be exacerbated by her pseudoephedrine use. It was quite copious, actually, over the last couple of days. And then also some med noncompliance with her amlodipine and her hypertension. So she had her blood pressure lowered with labetalol, uh, and it was uh, also determined that she should get some LASIK diuresis for her mild heart failure. And then she was scheduled for follow-up with ophthalmology two weeks later. Then at that follow-up visit, uh, her vision was then 2125 in the right eye and count fingers in the left eye. And if you recall, her vision had been like 2030 in the right eye and 20 you know, 125 in the left eye, so still decreasing vision. And she's found to have new onset macular edema uh, in the right eye, continued papal edema, and then she had that persistent tractional retinal detachment of the uh, macular retinal. Thought to ideally need surgery. And she also needed more PRP in both eyes, but the patient was really reluctant because she had issues that, you know, happened temporarily to her after her PRP in the left eye. This is the fundus photo, again, um, the blurring of the disc margins and that appearance of nerve edema is greater, especially in that left eye. Um, you know, vessels definitely obscured there. And uh, she still has that heme emanating from the disc and hemorrhages kind of throughout the retina. This is the right eye. As you recall, before it had been normal, now she has uh, new macular edema some intraretinal and both subretinal fluid. The left eye continued to have this kind of tractional appearance of detachment and worsened edema. This was an OCT of her retinal nerve fiber layer. Uh, as you can see, uh, worse in the left than the right eye, but both very thickened, especially on those uh, graphs that you can see below. So at this point, um, the plan was for bilateral intravitreal Avastin injections. Um, in consultation with the neuro-ophthalmology team, it was thought to delay retinal surgery for this tractional retinal detachment in the left eye until the optic nerve edema uh, was resolved because uh, pressures can fluctuate during surgery and, and worries about that uh, uh, integrity of the left optic nerve. So uh, the patient was started on Dimox 500 BID and decided uh, the course was to get an LP to measure opening pressure if the nerve and macular edema did not improve um, in five days after that. 
and then followed up in five days. So the patient followed up five days. This is three weeks total after that admission for the high. And the vision was still poor, but it had improved slightly from that. The macular edema had slightly improved. Um, All right, so this is uh, just an FA. Uh, as you can see, there's leakage uh, emanating from the optic nerve in both eyes, um, but there was no vessel staining, uh, a non-perfusion uh, suggestive of like a CRVO picture. And finally, uh, just to kind of jump to the uh, diagnosis, the lumbar puncture showed an opening pressure of 29 centimeters of water and otherwise uh, she had normal CSF studies. So uh, the next visit was with neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, this was one month after the admission. Um, and they confirmed uh, the patient kind of didn't have many symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure, uh, diplopia, transient visual obscurations, or pulsatile tinnitus, but she did endorse a little bit more of a headache history. Uh, that was kind of daily mild headaches. And then a uh, contrasted head imaging was ordered. As you recall in the ED, it was a non-contrasted MRI. And then NAA, CC, ESR, CRP, INCA were ordered and they increased the Dymox to 1,000 milligrams of PAD. Okay, so then this was the uh, visual field that was taken, as you can see, Kind of a global depression in both eyes, a little bit more patchy, uh, but with definite you know, blind spot enlargement in that right eye, um, and then you know, kind of a superior arcuate, um, partial inferior arcuate. So uh, in the next visit with retina, um, this is two months after the admission, vision was you know, markedly improved, 20-30 in the right eye, 20-60 in the left eye. Uh, macular edema was resolved <clears throat> in the right eye and was just mild in the left eye. And then interestingly, the, uh, this tractional retinal detachment of the macular um, So no plans were made for surgery, um, but we did treat the macular edema in the left eye. And the patient did actually agree to additional PRP in the left eye. Uh, so cumulative total was about 2,000. This is just showing the resolution of that macular edema in the right eye, and then in the left eye, uh, you know, the reduction of that traction there. Then finally, four months after admission, um, the patient had been lost to follow up. Uh, the patient actually contracted COVID-19, uh, but still a relatively good vision. Uh, increased macular edema in the left eye, that was kind of expected. Uh, she's supposed to follow up a little bit sooner. And then and finally, the uh, you know, CT uh, venogram didn't show any signs of venous sinus thrombosis. Uh, the sleep study was still pending and she hadn't received those labs. Uh, but the plan was just to continue treating uh, the right eye with a Vastin um, to prevent recurrence of this PDR uh, and hemorrhage and then to continue Diamox 1500 BID uh, per neuro-ophthalmology. So uh, discussion a little bit about IIH. So mechanics, um, basically the optic nerve sheath uh, is continuous to the subarachnoid space. And so increased pressure uh, from that subarachnoid space gets transmitted through uh, to the optic nerve. And then there's a gradient difference between the anterior end of the optic nerve and the Swelling of the retinal ganglion cells occurs. And then the common signs and symptoms that we transient visual obscurations, and diplopia uh, due to cranial nerve 6 uh, dysfunction. And then signs on uh, imaging are empty cella, transverse sinus stenosis. 
Um, the incidence is uh, one in 100,000, but it actually jumps to about 20 in 100,000 if they're uh, women who are obese. And as you recall, this uh, patient had a BMI of 63. Factors in women. Um, secondary increased uh, intracranial pressure is an interesting topic. Uh, we're trying to kind of purge out of the literature that this is the actually idiopathic. Oh, tetracyclines, vitamin A, OCPs, lithium, SLE, hypothyroid, OSA would not be uh, technically idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the modified Dandy criteria. Um, so the above picture is Walter Edward Dandy. It's interesting. He was born in 1897. He was the son of a railroad engineer, but became the father of pediatric neurosurgery. Um, dandy Walker malformations, a bunch of different things that he's famous for. He described uh, four criteria that eventually were codified um, in the 1980s by uh, Dr. Smith. And then our very own Dr. Degree um, added the criteria listed on here, number three and number six. Um, and so this is kind of the criteria that we use to diagnose IH. Um, theories about the production of CSF versus the drainage of fluid. Um, some people think that, you know, an excess of CSF production or an increased volume of blood or brain tissue cause an overproduction issue. Um, there's also um, theories about the obstruction of the venous plexus draining, um, which can cause problems um, absorbing through those arachnoid granulations and then this kind of uh, wicked feedback. In any case, Diamox works to inhibit the carbonic anhydrase in the chloride plexus and reduces uh, CSF production. Um, just to shift gears a little bit, because uh, we had kind of thought that this uh, edema and decrease in vision uh, could be due to macular edema. So looking into that a little bit, it in different studies about 25 to 43% of eyes with PDR that then get treated with PRP, uh, get macular um, And in a recent study of 76 eyes that got treated, about 14 eyes still had worsened visual acuity at three months. So uh, worsened visual acuity at a month or a week after is quite common. Um, and uh, they did have you know, macular edema that was uh, substantially thickened, and they also had subfoveal serious detachments in about 16 eyes. So that's you know, 10% of these eyes. So it's not uncommon and uh, not unusual to see after PRP. Other hand, um, in a recent study of 55 patients that had papal edema, five patients, um, so a little bit less than 10%, arise from the parapapillary region um, from IAH specifically. Um, so usually, and I was looking up the anatomy, there's this tissue, um, it's called the intermediary border tissue of cunt. And that's glial tissue that kind of has a ring around the optic nerve and creates tight leakage of fluid from the optic nerve into the retina. Um, but that becomes disrupted um, through uh, a mechanism that they're not exactly sure, honestly, and then you have some continuity between this subfoveal region and the optic nerve. Um, often, uh, this is why, and this is a, a table from that study, the fluorescein angiogram doesn't show leakage um, into the macula um, from the vessel. Or instead of vascular leakage. Um, just a little bit about, uh, you know, hyper um, reflectives kind of subretinal spaces on the OCT. Uh, I know we're getting a little short on time here, but uh, there was a study by Savini, uh, 12 eyes who had various types of optic disc edema. And they talked about how their theory was that in addition to leakage of fluid, um, extensive swelling of the optic nerve can actually elevate and uh, create kind of a tractional separation between sensory retina and RPE. And this might have been actually what was going on in the left eye of our patient. Um, this is not heavily reported, um, but it certainly makes sense um, to have some traction uh, and kind of vitreo macular traction due to elevation of that optic nerve head. Okay. Um, just in the interest of time, other entities that I looked at um, that can cause uh, both optic nerve edema and a macular 
contraction, diabetic papillopathy. Um, this was reported a little bit more in patients who uh, have a quick reduction in their sugar, which could have happened to her in the hospital, but uh, we're kind of looking at initial presentation for her. Um, some think that that diabetic papillopathy is from with NION um, because of it's kind of a reversible ischemia of the prelaminal nerve tissue, but um, honestly, we don't understand it very well. And then uh, obviously hypertensive retinopathy and subretinal fluid from NAION. One interesting study that I found, found about 10% of patients, eight out of those 76 patients that did have uh, evidence of subfoveal fluid in NAION um, and their FA uh, showed staining of the optic disc but didn't have accumulation of fluid around the macula. So it was truly thought to be from the nerve. So just a couple of uh, take home learning points. Um, thinking about horses versus zebras, we're thinking about, you know, bilateral CRVO, which is, you know, rare and associated with, you know, cancers and stuff like that. Our horses, you know, IH in this case may have been a little bit more likely uh, versus a zebra. Um, the other importance of checking patient's vitals in ophthalmology clinic, it was a good catch to check that her pressure was actually, you know, 220 over 100, and though that didn't end up being her final diagnosis. It certainly was not um, healthy for her. And then uh, getting a multidisciplinary approach involving neuro-ophthalmology is definitely important, especially in these complicated patients. And then finally, um, intervention's not always the answer. Um, classically, you would want to repair a tractional retinal detachment, at least within a month, um, and do it kind of quickly, um, but delaying surgery was obviously the right choice here. And with proper treatment of her papilledema, um, the macular edema and the uh, traction resolved on its own. Uh, these are my references. Big thanks to Dr. Wong, uh, Dr. C, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, stop sharing my screen here. So, uh, great presentation, Mike. Um, are you guys able to hear me? Uh, can anyone hear me? I can hear your audio clearly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, I just wanted to uh, clarify, you know, one point here, uh, which is that uh, when she developed the macular edema, um, it was two weeks after she developed the optic nerve edema. Um, so um, I didn't treat it with Avastin um, because I did not think it was diabetic macular edema. Usually diabetic macular edema, I don't think develops that quickly. Uh, so I uh, expected that uh, with controlling the optic nerve edema that that macular edema would improve and that was indeed the case. Sorry about that. We got oh, some we go. feedback on from you. Thank you, Elaine, for the clarification. Let's see, I think Dr. Warner wanted to be unmuted for a comment real quick. Well, she has a lot of medical problems, right? And um, so I was wondering um, what you were thinking about, uh, you know, her hypertension causing the disc edema. Um, some people with very bad hypertension can have elevated intracranial pressure, most do not. Um, and the other question was about uh, her congestive heart failure. I did, I, I don't know uh, how detailed uh, the look into that was, but obviously right heart failure can also lead to um, quite intractable elevated intracranial pressure. Um, you know, we all remember back in medical school looking for jugular venous distension as a sign of, um, of congestive heart failure, but those jugular veins are coming from somewhere. Yeah. I think it's uh, definitely something that, first I'll take the hypertension question, that for her, obviously she wasn't controlling her hypertension, but I think what made us think less that it might be 
the root cause was that once she had it well controlled, the nerve edema persisted in those visits afterwards. Um, as we're playing a role in the etiology, you know, of why her um, feedback loop got it started, et cetera, um, could definitely be playing a role. I think also her BMI is uh, a big factor. And then for the CHF, um, her echocardiogram in the ED showed that she had mild, uh, I think it was right and left heart uh, dysfunction because she did have some kind of pulmonary edema that was backing up. But I think they thought it was left heart causing right heart. And once they diureased her mildly, that got better. Great. And then I think uh, Dr. Hartnett would like to be unmuted potentially. Ethan, did we get Dr. Hartnett unmuted? Let me just see. Okay, Dr. Hartnett. Yeah, thank you. Um, very interesting case. Thank you, Mike. Nice presentation. So, um, it you know, in retrospect, I, I agree there wasn't a lot of vitreal macular traction in that left eye. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not always easy to, to see that, you know, at the, at the first step when it's so complex. But one of the things to think about when doing PRP is to limit the number of spots per session, especially in those eyes that not only have PDR, but have signs of extremely severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which I think are signs that can be also similar to inflammation that you see would see on a fluorescing where you might have staining of vessels. But those would be like venous beading or erma um, or lots of hemorrhages. And the reason for limiting it is the same way when we think about the crunch phenomenon in giving Avastin, that mm -hmm. you, when you do a lot of PRP, you may be reducing the angiogenic drive a lot, but you're also probably increasing inflammation as well. So just something not necessarily related to this case, but just I think can be helpful. No, I think that's definitely, it was at, you know, the top of our minds differential wise because she had had that PRP in the months before. So I think it's definitely a good point. All right. Thanks everyone for comments. I think Megan always wants us to remind the uh, CME link is in the chat if everyone needs it. And I'll kind of mute myself if anyone has other things to say or Ethan, if you need to tell us anything, let me know. Mike, I think there was one more comment by Dr. Huang. If hypertension or CHF caused her nerve edema, wouldn't it have improved with control of hypertension or CHF? Yeah, I think that's what we were talking about, how um, the interplay between those sort of got resolved because the ED helped us resolve her, you know, hypertension, CSF, diureister, controlled her uh, hypertension, and then she had persistent uh, nerve edema. But I think it's definitely something that is common and we could always think about. All right, I think that's it. We'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you for everyone for joining and thanks to uh, Catherine and Mike um, for your presentations. Mm -hmm.